Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's program, Images of Railroading, Seven Tips for Better Photos. I'm Scarlett Ward, the program coordinator for the National Railway Historical Society's Washington chapter. Uh, you don't see me, I'm having camera difficulties, but when we said images of railroading, it wasn't me you were coming to see, so we'll not be too concerned about that tonight. Thank you for joining us. I've been really looking forward to this program so very much, um, not only because I hope to learn some things about photography, but also the photographs that we're gonna look at are just stunningly beautiful. A few words tonight about um, our organization for those of you who may not be um, members or know much about us. The National Railway Historical Society's Washington chapter is an educational nonprofit with the mission of expanding public appreciation of railroads and their history. Tonight's program is one of an ongoing monthly series, and this is an important way that we accomplish our mission. We have a few other activities that um, you may be interested to know about. We own and operate three rail cars, including the Pullman Car Dover Harbor, which provides opportunities for both preservation and rail travel. We fund an annual scholarship to Amtrak's Rail Camp, which supports development of the next generation of railroaders. And our railroad library and newsletter, The Timetable, are rich resources for in-depth information and research on rail topics. Because tonight's program is about rail photography, I'd be remiss if I didn't begin with a few words on safety. These rules are from Operation Lifesaver, and you may have seen them recently in the timetable. I think almost all railroad photographers are aware of these safety rules, but it can sneak up on you. Just to kind of share a personal experience, because I'm not afraid to share my learning experiences in public. Uh, several years ago, I was out rail fan and at Magnolia Cutoff in West Virginia. And there was a big CSX freight train coming through loaded with coal and he was just laying on the horn as he approached that tunnel. And it wasn't any of the usual signals you're expecting from that sort of approach. And it kind of gradually dawned on me that I was, had drifted towards the track and was just about on it. And I was way too close. So of course, I was kind of shaken and I jumped back. But that optical illusion problem is very real. Probably the most important rule I want to emphasize tonight is rule six. It's probably obvious when you're out there that you're setting an example when you're um, photographing. But I also want to kind of just mention that the photos you share also set an example. Uh, you may know that you had permissions to be on what looks like an abandoned track that's privately owned, but others might not know that because of course you did have permission. So when you share photos like that, the full context is important because it educates others kind of in a subtle way in the process. So that's enough about that. That ends my public service announcement for tonight. So moving on to the main event. I am beyond excited to introduce Ann Mason, uh, who will lead us in a discussion on the art of seeing as it relates to railroad photography. You may recognize Ann best as the timetable editor our newsletter, but she's also a railroad industry veteran and a very talented longtime photographer and artist. Anne has pulled together a collection of exquisite images in this program and assembled a panel of experts, and I think this will both educate and inspire us. So please join me in welcoming Anne Mason. Thanks, Scarlett. That was, that was great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. The, the photography is really about individual approach to looking at things and capturing events that could perhaps be a once in a lifetime event or a memorable event. And anyway, you're looking at capturing an image and capturing light. And so tonight we're going to be talking about seven tips that, that we four think are worthy of mention to anybody who's talking about photography or thinking about taking good pictures. And we want to emphasize that every photographer comes to photography and taking images in their own unique style. We all have our own individual approaches. And what we're, the tips we're going to offer you is not to change your style or your approach, but rather to give you something to think about as you want to improve your photography. Tonight, I'm joined by Bob Bitzer, Alex Mays, and Garen Goldsmith. And collectively, we four 
have about, I don't know, 200 years or more of photography experience between us, but we don't know it all. So we're going to offer our insights and hope that you will take one or two things from it. And if you do, th this will be a successful evening for us. So we're gonna be dividing our, our time with you tonight into two sections. The first section, we're going to talk about the tips and we're going to give you example images for each one of the seven tips. The second section, we're going to have a panel discussion in which we're going to look at some terrific photography and talk about it among ourselves so that you'll get a sense that not only do we have different approaches, but we all have a common goal to really have great, great images to look at. So the first tip, know your equipment. Whether you're using an iPhone or an iPad or any a digital platform or a film platform, including some of these old timey um, cameras that I first started learning on back here in the 1930s cameras, not they were my mom's, I absconded with them. But I have a whole variety of cameras and Regardless of what camera you have, what you need to remember is you need to know your equipment. Bring that experience to the forefront. So it, taking an image, if you're in the middle of a, of a fast moving scene, is not the time to pull out your book and try to read how to take fast photography. Try that ahead of time. So that brings me to the second thing you want to talk about is tell a story with your photography. You can capture an image, but what are you trying to say when you go back home and look at that image and say, now what was I trying to capture? What was I trying to say? When you think about ahead of time what you're trying to capture, you can in the moment say, have I got it? Have I got it? If not, try to change your angle. So here's a photo that, that Alex took of uh, Ms. Kowalczyk rechristening the locomotive named for her at our a recent EBT day. And notice how he's captured the moment. This is a once in a lifetime moment. She's not gonna bust that uh, bottle again just for him. So he's anticipated that this is a christening of a locomotive and caught her in the act of wielding the bottle against the locomotive and capturing the spray. This tells a story. This image would be so much different if it was just Ms. Kowalczyk standing there with, it, with a broken bottle. That's a different storyline. So Think about what you're trying to capture ahead of time. So here's another image of a similar christening. Look at what this photographer did. He captured the lady christening the locomotive and well as all of the onlookers. And that captures, that tells a different story again. It's a side view. So think about what, you're, what image you're trying to capture and what you're trying to say in your image. Well, here's a, an image of a, a narrow gauge rail line in a, a observation car. And what the photographer, me, is trying to capture here is the individual excitement that the passengers are having. Some are engaging with each other, some of them are looking fairly bored. Some of them are looking outside mesmerized by the scenery whizzing by. This to me tells a story of this, this group of people all experiencing the same event, but in different ways. So our third tip, if you're going to take an image and you want to get a specific shot, pre-visualize what it is you're trying to get. Just as in the image of Ms. Kowalczyk and christening the locomotive, Alex was trying to get her 
in position with a head-on shot. That's pre-visualization. And in some cases, you're going to be going to a, a site to look at, at machines going by. You want to think about what time of day are you planning on going? What time of season are you planning on going? Because if you have bright light versus cloudy light, it gives you a different feeling. Do you need a permit to get on the property? Basically do your research ahead of time. Think about what you're trying to do, do your research, and you'll be much more successful and much more satisfied with the image that comes out. In the days of our internet, capturing information about a location that you haven't been to before is, is, is starting to be more easy. It also, a site visit before you take a really memorable picture, if you can do it, do that. So you know exactly where you wanna position yourself. Now, when you go to a site, pre-visualizing helps you understand what equipment you wanna take. Here's Alex taking a once in a lifetime opportunity to take the OY um, snowplow from the Combrus and, and Taltec. If he didn't have a long lens, he would not have captured this splendid photo. Here's another one. Again, it's the, the Combrus and Toltec. Again, Alex used his long lens to capture the crew putting in sand in the dome to get up that 4% grade that they were about to approach. If he didn't have a long lens, if he just had a wide angle or a, a narrow, a normal lens, he would not have been able to capture this great photo. So again, pre-visualize what you need. In a slightly different vein, here's an, a photographer who went to a, a site looking at this diamond and saw a fabulous opportunity to take a really striking picture with a wide angle lens. So if he only had a telephoto in his camera kit, he would not have been able to take this terrific picture with two vanishing points and a real emphasis on the diamond and the building in front. Here's another one. Here's a photographer trying to take more of an architectural picture where you're looking at positioning uh, yourself, looking at three different levels of train tracks going in an area. By knowing the light and positioning yourself with the correct lens, you're able to take this really art striking architectural picture. So tip four, lighting, photography is about light. So capture the mood and the emotion that you're looking for. Sun gives you one kind of, a, of an emotion as this picture. If you have bright sunshine, you can get the striking contrast on the locomotive and on the man leaning on the, the porch step there. This picture would be very different in shade or in rain or in night. So lighting helps you create a mood. Don't be afraid to go out in inclement weather, but do try to protect your equipment. So you'll need a rain guard for rain or snow. Let's take another look at, at here's a nighttime shot, which is a terrific shot that Alex took using the, the, the light in the yard. So he, but he was able to capture this nighttime shot um, splendidly, but it gives you a very different image. If you thought about what this image might look like during the day, it would be a very, very different image. Here's a snow picture. Again, if you look at all of these different images, they all have a different emotive feeling. Here you see the snow is falling, the steam is bustling, the engine is moving. It gives a great moody image. Now let's look at another one in rain. And Bob was just in the right position 
to capture this rain event where you have the water pouring over the waterfall, positioning that locomotive to appear like a toy. It's not a toy, but it appears like a toy. But you can tell that the, the rain has a different emotive feeling. So don't be afraid to go, just because it's not a sunny day, get out there and shoot. Composition. You could attend many, many classes on composition, and some of us have. But one of the things you want to look at in a composition is your layers of your photography. So here we have a, in the foreground, we have a tree, but bending over into the, the image. This sets a frame around the image, which is a, a trick photographers use to try to, to focus your eye on what's important. Look at, the, this has a foreground, it has a foreground, it has a perspective that's going out on a curve. Diagonals are always strong in photography. You have the little red barn, the second barn that was built on this same property. And so you have a real nice balance of, of this image. Foreground with the tree and the brush over here, middle ground, and then the mountains in the back. So you have multiple layers. Your eye moves through this image. Let's look at this image in a different way. Back in the day when Helmstead's curve was being created, you see here's the first barn and where you have a high contrast with whites against darks, your eye naturally goes there. So you see that this is where your eye first comes is to look at the barn, which is kind of in the middle of the picture, but then it drops down to the, to the foreground where you have this whitish sand or snow that happens to be here on the ground. But then your eye travels up the hill and then up the hill and then down the trestle. And so this is the construction of Helmstetter's curve where they built a wooden trestle and then backfilled it with soil so that you could, they could get from um, the grade to the grade. It's a terrific old timey picture. So here's another picture that we're gonna look from a compositional standpoint. You see in the foreground, you've got these switch stands, but you're, that they normally just lead your eye right back into the background of the picture where you see this locomotive in dark shade. The locomotive shape brings your eye up over to the hilltops or the, by the trees and then back up through the other locomotive. This is a great composition where your eye just moves through the picture. And when you start thinking about images in a way of foreground, middle ground, background, and how, you're, how you frame the image and your vanishing point, you start looking at images in an intentive way of this is what I wanted to capture in the image. But you'll, you'll start to figure out that, uh, that this wasn't quite right. Why am I not getting quite right? And you can move to get yourself in position and get a stronger image. So let's look at another, another picture. This per picture is terrific. You see it. All of these um, folks that are in this tour group are lined up with their bright orange safety vests. But this picture would be nothing without the Clumbrus and Toy, Toy Tech OY snow plow coming in. You had to wait for it. So it, taking photography is a lot of waiting. It's taking patience. And it's also taking images from a different perspective. In this one, Alex got the, the, as the locomotive was coming by, the OY is spewing out the, the uh, snow. This framed, this man here is framed 
looking at the OI, but he's framing the picture looking back in so that the, you keep your eye moving in this circle. I think you'll all agree this is a terrific picture. It really tells the story. One image tells the story of the whole trip. Now this is a different story. Here you have a group of, of on that same trip, you have a group of the photographers in their safety vests, pregnantly looking at something. This is still a good picture. It's a good diagonal picture. And you're wondering what it is they're looking at. It has a sense of mystery. Okay, now when you look at an image and you look at this picture, this photographer took a picture high overlooking Harper's Ferry, and you could see you've got your two bridges, you've got Harper's Ferry here, you've got the river coming through. And by just changing the angle of his position, you see that the bridges now show the river running through under the bridges. You see that, the, that this river is a cohesive way of bounding the peninsula and going into the vanishing point in the back. And you can see that this makes a, just a much more coherent image. So just by moving your angle, and I would say this is probably less than six inches, moving your angle from this image on your left to the image on your right, you can sometimes just change it just enough to get a fantastic picture. So take lots of pictures. Digital photography is um, cheaper than that old film photography where you can just burn a lot of pixels and, and they're pretty inexpensive. Let's look at this. Here's a woman who is a terrific photographer. She has a lot of great, great images. But this is a set that spoke to me in terms of preparing this talk to give you a viewpoint of why it's important to really think about context around a picture. Here she was taking a typical picture of a locomotive, sort of on a, an oblique angle, looking down the, the train, but looking more from a head-on perspective. She opened up her context, her viewpoint, to show that here is the, that same locomotive, but you can also see the water tank in the background and the tracks that go out to the vanishing point. So you've got a context of where this locomotive is placed. Now, in a third sequence in this photo shoot, she did a straight on shot. All the, these three pictures are terrific, but they all tell a slightly different story. So don't be afraid. If you're on a site, move around, take pictures from different angle because they're all going to tell you something slightly different. Let's look at this in a different way. We all love to take pictures of, at least I'll speak for myself, I love to take pictures of train stations. This is a real powerful picture looking from a, a train uh, station platform down the tracks. But look, you can see the foreground of the tracks are clear. You can see the far distance that there's a building and some background out there. But your eye is blocked by the, this curvature, bringing your eye back into the station with this awaiting train. So, And all of this curvature in the ceiling it helps your eye just move around. This is a really powerful and very brilliant picture. But let's look at this one. In that same location, this is not the same location, but, but if you have a same location, wander around, get off the platform. Here, they, this photographer went one level up to the platform walking across all of the tracks and took a straight down shot gives a very different image of, of this uh, train station. That other station, both were abandoned with people. Don't be afraid to put people in your picture. Here's on a second level, looking down the track. Here's a train disembarking people, going up a platform and looking at the passenger across the way, passengers um, 
platform across the, the tracks. All of these are just, just really strong pictures, but they all are different. They all give you a different perspective and they're all very valuable. So if you're going out and you get a shot like this, see around, look around and see if you have a second platform and take different angles. Okay, now comes to the tough part. When you look at your images, you have to critique them. You can't just say, hey, that's great, I'm done. Because what you want to do is you want to come back and whether you do it on site so that you can take another picture or whether you go back to your studio or your computer and you say, gee, I missed. It's good to be tough with yourself. It's good to really think about what were you trying to get and what did you get? This talk is all about being positive. So here's the moment where I'm going to critique my own image. Here's the 611 on its, uh, one of its eventful trips when it was touring the Mid-Atlantic on its way down to the Virginia uh, Railway Museum. I wanted to capture the power of this huge machine that is magnificent. And when I looked at this image, I didn't like its composition because I liked the way the, the, the image was captured of the tender and the locomotive, but this pole is directing your eye out of the screen. The smoke is directing your eye out of the screen. And therefore, your image is going out. So I moved myself around and I came around to the front of the locomotive where I positioned the, the tower going into the picture, but this, the, these wires coming down bring you, your eye back down into the locomotive. Going down to the locomotive to its vanishing point, I was able to capture some excitement from the pedestrians and the train watchers looking here and talking to the engineer. So just by thinking about your picture, did it meet your conception or your previsualization, or do you want to take a different picture? Both of these pictures are okay, but they tell a different story. Now, here's a terrific picture by, by Bob. He took it in, in a color picture, but when he looked at it back in his uh, studio, he said, this really Billy needs to be a black and white. So here you go. His photographer's eye said, I want to show an old timey kind of a picture and he changed the picture to black and white. So it's all about the photographer's eye, our individual eye. Don't try to be like anybody else. Maybe learn from how other people take images, but be your own unique self. So now we're going into a discussion and Bob and Alex and Garen and I are going to look at a whole set of photography and I'm going to moderate a discussion among the three of them. So ready guys? Take yourselves off mute and let's rock and roll. Okay, this is a picture that Bob took. So Bob, tell us about your picture. I think one thing when we take pictures of trains coming at us, we sometimes forget that there is a, a tail end to every train and the tail end can tell an interesting story within itself. So hang around, take a picture of the rear end of the train yeah, unfortunately, we don't have as many cabooses as we used to have, but a caboose, when they were on trains, certainly made a very colorful end of story, if you will. And also, look at your scenery backdrop. And you know, if the scenery is good of the train coming at you, take a look and see if the scenery of the train going away from you has an opportunity to create another picture. That's one of the things I've always tried to do. You can do it the same with the passenger train. You could have a magnificent observation car 
on the rear of a train. You could have crew equipment on the rear of the train, but even crew members doing something. So there's a lot of opportunities to get trains both coming and going. As far as composition rules go, this basically follows what I call the four layer step. You have the brush in the front, you have the train in the middle, the mountain range, and then the sky. So it's basically one, two, three, four stages. And as Anne has pointed out, it has the um, power lines leading your eye into the foreground or the background of the uh, picture. So that is some of the things that I uh, use when I take uh, pictures of trains. How can I get it both coming and going? Look at it from a creative standpoint, both, both directions, if you will. End of discussion on my part. Now everybody else can tear it apart and say they don't like it. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think we all pretty much like this. Um, Garen or Alex, you want to have anything to say about Bob's picture? Well, this Alex, see the composition obviously is very good. Uh, I don't know if Bob had, had pre-visualized this or not, but he was in the right place at the right time to get everything. I, I really like the snow on the uh, tops of the mountains. That really adds a lot to it. Well, this is what I meant when I said patience, because you just have to wait for the train and you have to wait for the end. You can't just say, oh, I got that. I got that locomotive. I'm done. You know, this is pre-visualizing and waiting. And Bob could have been anywhere along the track here. He really positioned himself so that he could get this beautiful orange um, caboose positioned against the gray and and the, the white of the mountains, and the orange and the blue are complementary colors. So it's, it's really, it's a terrifically powerful picture. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, we all like this picture a lot. Um, one of the things that's really helpful, as I mentioned earlier, is the framing. And here, Lawrence uh, framed this uh, picture of the locomotive beautifully by taking this image out of a uh, barn. So who wants to comment on this picture? It, this is Alex, this is a very creative. I don't know if he planned this or just snapped it, but uh, there, everything came together, the framing and all that it really uh, adds a lot to it. Well, I would agree. The uh, picture draws your eye to the activity on the train, first the engine, then the activities, and all the way into the background. It tells a four-stage story. And uh, I've always liked pictures that are built into a frame. And uh, I think this one's an excellent example of that type of photography. I think we all agree this was a great picture. We're not all blessed to have to go to a look a photo shoot and have it already set up with lights um, and we're not going to talk about the setup with lights this the way the techniques of setting up a, a, a shot like this with lights and in this presentation that will be a, a separate uh, presentation that was that we'll make in the future but Bob tell us the story about this image and what you were trying to capture well, this was basically set up to tell a story of railroading during a transitional period. Uh, and it also was to show employees doing their normal routine in a railroad yard. And as you can see, the crew members are talking to each other. They're getting the work orders ready for the uh, evening runs. And that was the idea behind it. It was to show railroading as it was during the transitional period from diesel to steam, but employees doing their jobs as part. It, it's to tell the story of railroaders doing their normal routine work and getting their engines set up and ready for the, uh, for the runs. I hope that covers it. <laughs> well, uh, Alex, you want to say anything? Yes, like Bob said, this was a setup. They put 
Steve Barry and a few others. Uh, with, this is at the, a, at the National Railway Historical Society's convention in Scranton several years ago. And uh, it was set up by people really very talented and the creative of, of setting up night photos. As you can see, the whole the tender of the steam engine is not cut off by the uh, diesel. So they put a lot of thought into this, a lot of trial and error, and this is what they came up with. Yep, I agree. Now, one of the things I like about this image is the way in which the locomotives are positioned to, you know, obliquely sort of not quite on a right angle, but obliquely to one another. And the blue of this Lackawanna is incredible. Well, here's something just for all the technocrats out there. I will throw this in uh, because we discussed this once before. That's not the final paint scheme of a Lackawanna engine. It's missing its uh, maroon striping. <laughs> because I don't want somebody writing uh, us and saying, well, gee whiz, it never existed. <laughs> that, that, that's just primer. That's primer in early stages. Of that's good. Yeah, that's true. It was just primer. Good looking primer, but uh, that's not the, the final color. Yeah, they put but the yellow and the blue and then the burgundy and then the lettering on. It looks, it looks great now. That, that engine was built in 1947. The EMD F3. There's very few of them around. That's true. But from a color balance perspective, the blue balances the red and the, the uh, locomotive light here, the orange, it, it just beautifully. This picture would be very different if this was a uh, maroon color. If it sported its normal, normal liter livery. Well, let's go to another really terrific picture. This is another uh, setup shop um, that was taken. Was this also at an NRHS event, Bob? Yeah, this was a uh, NRHS convention in, um, oh, mine yeah, just went yeah. blank. Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Yeah, this is at the um, museum TBR. out there that has the 610, along with several other steam locomotives. This was a setup uh, a photograph, again, uh, for a convention. Uh, there was a several lighting teams. But what we were trying to do is, you know, recreate uh, a steam passenger local coming into, you know, a, a, a local station and uh, getting ready to pick up its passengers. I think if we could have done one other thing on this picture. We might have added some people uh, in the station uh, if I was going to, you know, make any comment. But again, this was one of those structured setups with a lighting team, and uh, they did a great job on getting the lighting set up for this. Alex, do you you were there? Uh, yeah. Do you have any other comments? Yeah, that's a long time ago. I don't know when this the uh, convention was, but uh, it's it's perfect. I mean, uh, like like I say, we do one thing we need to include that. When you have a whole bunch of photographers at a, at a convention like this, they tell you what they put your camera on bulb, and they tell you for for this type of uh, ex what type of exposure you need and all that. So it's no guesswork. But from a compositional standpoint, you can see that where Bob is standing, your vanishing point is off to the left part of the image, and your eye is captured by this maroon or oh, this uh, dusky pink mauve color which brings your eye back up here to the station i mean these balance really nicely um so that your eye comes back up uh it, this is a terrific uh shot at an angle remember i said that diagonals work really well in photography they're very powerful so even though you have a very vertical building. You have these strong diagonals in the pitch of the roof, the way that the rails are positioned in the image and the, the tender in the locomotive. I mean, this is a, just a terrific compositional picture. And if I may add something, I saw a question pop up on the screen. Uh, one of our uh, attendees asked if that was moving or still. That was still, it was not moving. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so now we're going to move away from the staged pictures. 
which we can all be so lucky to be Bob and Alex and others taking images when it's been all lit up for ourselves. But now we're going into natural light. So Bob, you were able to get this terrific shot um, in full sun. Tell us about it. Well, first off, that's a hard shot to, uh, shot to get. You have to crawl over barbed wire fences and a few other things. And Alex is shot there too. So he and I both know of how much fun it is to get in here. This is Linden, Virginia on the line to uh, Front Royal. That was when 1218 was making runs down there uh, during the first steam uh, program uh, that NS was running. And uh, I like the composition of this shot because as Ann said, color is good, light is good, over my shoulder. Um, and again, it follows one of my composition rules. Uh, it's, there's four stages in this picture. There's the foreground, there is the train itself, there's a curve, which is nice. And then there's the whole background of trees. And then you go up and your next layer is the mountains and it goes right up to the sky. Uh, and uh, you know, the train itself is coming from a curve. And it, um, it, has, it has, I think, reasonably good balance. Alex, anything more? Yeah, the, the lighting's stunning. Uh, I know that's a, I'm familiar with that location. That's I-66 way in the back. But uh, you know, this trip, I mean, came together. The fall foliage is, just, you know, so many years you have great foliage in this area, and this year it's awful because of the drought. But it all came together, and Bob was able to capture it. With the, it looks like he got the exposure all just right. One of the things that's really great about this picture is you can see the 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 color echoing around. So you've got this orange uh, car, you've got a bit of red and red and red echoing around to keep this really well balanced on the color basis. Just a brilliant, brilliant photo. Well, let's take another look at another um, terrific shot. This is again, one of yours, Bob. I swear I didn't pay anybody to put the pictures in this sequence. <laughs> it just happens. Uh, there's a good mix of pictures. This is Alaska Anchorage. This was also on an NRHS convention, and that is actually the NRHS convention train. And we got it posed out. This is coming into the airport station, and we got it posed out there so we could get this nice sweeping curve. The one thing that's nice about this shot, again, it has a curve. It leads your eye into the, and the yellow line is dramatic. It goes all the way through from the engine straight back to the other engines at the rear. And it gives you a natural uh, uh, follow through. And, and then, of course, the, uh, you've got the foreground, the train, the mountains, and the sky. That's, that's, that's what I call my four stages of... Um, of the view and how it leads your eye into it. Um, as I say, it's a great kind of PR shot for the Alaska Railroad. I didn't sell it to them though, they wouldn't buy it, I'm sorry. But anyway. <laughs> this is another shot that was staged during the convention. This was staged by Bart Jennings, a very uh, accomplished photographer, very creative. And uh, he, you know, we, the train pulled forward first, you know, way past the photo line now. People want to get off and take pictures, got off, and then you back the train out and just stationary. So you can just, you know, bracket your exposure so you, nobody can possibly, you know, mess things up. You know, you, everybody comes away with a nice shot. Well, one of the things I, I will say that everybody can come away with a nice shot, but from a compositional standpoint, see how this rail kisses the left corner of the image but doesn't cut off. I mean, that's masterful to, 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 because it, it brings your eye and the rail up to the edge, but doesn't take you out, it brings you back in. And like Bob said, the, the bright yellow brings you all the way in, where the green then brings your eye up over the mountains and this mountain range coming down, brings your eye back into the, where the 
locomotive is. I mean, anybody can take a picture, but thinking about your composition so that you don't cut off the the rail and have your rail go off the side here, this picture would be very different if it was half an inch over um, and and your your eye was wandering out to the left side. Great, terrific shot. Well, here's another old timey one. Darren, are you out there? Do you want to yep. say? Yes, I'm here. Would you like to say something about this image? Well, I think it has an historical uh, perspective to it. The people there observing the train, and uh, it of course was probably uh, very innovative in those years. And the picture has the uh, the full length of the train in it, plus the surrounding area. So from an historical standpoint, it gives you uh, a good uh, bit of evidence of what things were like back then. Well, I like the image. Um, you have a clear vanishing point that goes out here, but your eye doesn't really want to linger there because you've got this big building and all of the people trying to hug you back into the picture. So your eye keeps moving around. Great that you have the building that is on a horizontal plane here that stops your eye from wanting to wander out. It kind of helps keep your eye in this central part of the picture. Again, got strong diagonal lines. This is just a great picture. Uh, this is obviously a public relations photo because that's a, the new, brand new diesel. This is taken in the 30s when the diesels were very rare. And the person used, you know, probably a four by five Graflex camera. And it was a cloudy, a cloudy, bright day, so you don't see shadows of the people or anything. And uh, so, you, you know, no matter which, where the sun is, under those conditions, you can always get a very good shot. You don't have to worry about the shadows or sun angles. Great. So let's go to another uh, shot. Alex, this is one of yours. Why don't you tell us the story of this? Well, yeah, well, you can see right there, things are a little crooked. Uh, I should have, when I'm, this is taken from a, uh, a, a color print, 40 year old color print from Kodak, and it retained its uh, color and all that. But I sh when, I, when I scanned it, I should have uh, you know, rotated everything to the right. But I was st here taking pictures, uh, you know, and uh, right at the, uh, I'm standing on a Blomberg chocolate factory's uh, loading platform, and uh, I just, nobody bothered me. I just wanted to get a shot of two two uh, trains, you know, coming out or coming in. And I waited, waited for about an hour. And I finally was rewarded with this shot. One of the great things about this shot, Alex, is that here in your foreground, you've got a lovely uh, vegetation growing here. But you've also got this trackage that while some of it goes off to the right out of the picture, Predominantly, what you're looking at is the, is the rails that go into the picture and then bring you right into your four of, of middle uh, locomotive and train with this wonderful yellow stripe going through. Your eye doesn't really want to wander outside of the picture because you've got this... Um, um, signal bridge. The signal bridge, thank you. The signal bridge that helps keep your focal point right in the middle of this picture, which is, is terrific. It's also balanced by these really tall buildings, which, Alex, you lined it up so great. Here's the tall building and the front end of this locomotive line up, and it's, it just helps bring your eye back down and into the picture. Just terrific. I took that in August of 1978. And there's nothing in that shot of, in a railroad. It's still there. It's all gone. That's the John Hancock building in the far left. It's still there. But you know, the signal bridge and locomotives, all that's all been replaced. Well, well I like the shot because it just shows an awful lot of history. It shows passenger service. It shows the older signaling system with semaphores, which are really neat. And it shows it's an industrial type of shot. You know, you've got the big city in the background. You've got warehouse, office buildings, and it's just a well-balanced shot as far as I'm concerned. I like uh, 
shots that show industrial rail and show the cityscape. I think uh, that's what makes this, to me, a very nicely balanced shot. And it captured a piece of very important history, which, as Alex said, doesn't exist anymore. Or at least think, a good yeah, chunk of it doesn't exist. I think it's a terrific, terrific composition. Well, uh, thank you. Okay, so now let's go to the grittier side of railroading. Alex, tell us about this. Well, I was I was just in the hobby, just got started in the hobby. I, you know, when I first started in 76, I didn't have a decent camera. I worked my way up and I finally bought a Konica so I could afford at the time. And I saw an article in Pastor Train Journal about commuter trains in Chicago. They all had E units and F units and sort of a few Amtrak trains. So I got I got a week off from work and drove out to Chicago you know, with the maps in my hand. And this is ended up at Roosevelt Road, which is the most popular photo, photographic place in Chicago. And I just knew the Broadway Limited was coming out at five. And I got there with my telephoto 135 uh, millimeter lens and I took a shot of it and, as a Burlington Northern train was backing in. So and, uh, the fucky track work there was amazing. Bob, any comments? Garen? I would say that Alex did one very important thing, and this is what we kind of talked about at the very beginning, and that's doing a lot of good research. Research is very important to get good photographs, and you did your research, Alex. <laughs> well, what, like Ann said, uh, uh, pre-visualizing, I never heard that word before, I had to look it up, but pre-visualizing is just, if you want to get a nice shot, shot, you have to, you have to know where the, the sun's going to be and, you know, and when the trains are going to show up and all that has to come together. And it, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You know, it could be raining. But you could still have got a great picture in the rain in this, in, in this position with these two locomotives coming at you. I mean, I, I, I think this is a terrific shot. Well, thank I, you. I particularly love all of this... Uh, <laughs> track work here. Um, all this switching is just is just terrific. And your eye is immediately balanced the with the the two locomotives and the bridge across this smoke uh, and all this gritty side of railroading um, it, it just pleases me immensely because it 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 it, it shows industry working. Um, and having it against this background, it almost is, is like a backdrop, the, the buildings in the back. So it really keeps your eye right in this central part of the, the image. Just terrific. So let's go to the next one. Garen, tell us about this picture. Well, this is a part of my effort to capture history. This is the Reading Railroad Yard in Reading, Pennsylvania in July of 1977. It's one of a sequence of shots that I took at this yard on that date to document what the railroading was like shortly after Conrail took over. And the thing about this picture is it shows uh, a lot of different types of uh, rolling stock and we have some interesting cabooses. Caboose, and uh, the track work goes off into the distance and like you often say to the vanishing point and, uh, you know, far off in the distance, you see a lighting tower, too. So um, that's kind of what I do with my photography is I like to basically take pictures for historical purposes. And because I was on a walk bridge over the yard, I was able to get quite a lot of uh, image in one single frame. Well, I love the fact that you've got a lot of layers here. I mean, there's a lot to keep your eye going and the colors moving your color team around. You've got the greens moving up and through here and you've got this brilliant little old, looks like it might be a caboose, an orange caboose or a red caboose that, that balances off with some of the yellow and the blue over here. And it really gives you a variety of layers on a more of a vertical scape of through the image. Strong diagonals that you've got going on here, multiple of the strong diagonals, but there's some curves in here too. It really captures your eye. You also have that cut of hopper cars 
The Reading, of course, was uh, well known for hauling anthracite coal. So there are some of their hopper cars in the yard. Yeah, another composition point that, that we didn't go into because you can spend hours and hours and hours and lectures and lectures and lectures on composition. But I'll just mention it here. One of the, one of the uh, tricks for uh, photographers is to not have the horizontal um, horizon line going straight through your picture, right through the middle. And Garen did a really nice job of making it, uh, photographers always also use this one third, one third, one third rule. Um, rules are made to be broken, by the way. Um, but the, this shows one third is sky and two thirds is, is rail image. So uh, that is a, a, one of the typical rules that from a photographer's perspective helps strengthen your picture by, by you know, keeping it in a balance. So it's, it's just, just terrific. The composition and the lighting is just, just got it just right. And I like seeing the nostalgic things like this. You don't see cabooses. And some, some of them are in counter of paint, but the other ones are original, probably Reading Scheme or maybe Lehigh Valley. They're long gone. Well, there's a lot of history in this picture. Uh, as you said, you like to photograph history in your picture as well. You've got a lot of it there. Uh, a lot of the transitional stuff that was happening back in that era. Uh, it's well, well documented. And no graffiti. <laughs> That's true. Wow. <laughs> it's a it's long gonna... time in Photoshop to take the graffiti off of the engine or cars. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. We've had, a, uh, we've had a really great time talking through our, our seven tips. Let's just go through them one by one as a refresher, know your equipment, tell a story, and we've been telling our stories here as we've been reviewing a couple of these shots. Pre-visualize your equipment and take the equipment you need, because if you get to a site and you say, darn, I needed a, insert a word, you, and it's back 400 miles away, you, you're just going to get to be frustration. So do your research, pre-visualize your image, and, and kind of know what you're you're looking for. That doesn't mean that you should ignore that happy circumstance where everything comes together and it's just luck. Use lighting to enhance your mood and emotion. So don't be afraid to take just because it's not a sunny day. Get out there and shoot. Snow, rain, bright shade. All dark, all gives you different moods and different emotions, and it can all give you happy pictures. Um, and sometimes you don't know what you're going to, to get until you actually see what, what you get back when you download your pictures. Compose the image. We've talked a lot about composition just to give you some insights on at least the way I look at images. And, and because I started uh, with old equipment and then I went to a four by five. I'll tell you working with a four by five uh, is a long process and you learn a lot about composition when you want to take a picture and you go, you know, I've just sat here an hour fiddling and setting this thing up and I don't like it. Well, why don't I like it? So there's a lot of soul searching. So you don't have to go the, through the frustrations that I did by taking a, with a four by five, but just think of a couple of tips when you're, that we've talked about as you're composing your image and it'll help you uh, make it more intuitive in terms of composition. Practice patience, wait for the moment. You've heard several of our panelists say, we, I waited an hour, I waited all, you know, half an hour, I waited all day. Sometimes that's what it takes is just waiting for the, right sunlight, waiting for that right cloud, waiting for that right light, waiting for the right people to show up. Sometimes it's just a patient activity. Evaluate your own photography. Do it critically. It's only you talking to you. Did you like what you see? Did you like what you got? Why, how could you do it better? One of the tricks that I found is I go and I look at pictures 
pictures that other people have taken and that I really admire. And I say, how can I do something like that? And really think about how they took the image and how I could learn from how they took the image. And last, have fun. Get out there and take lots of images. Sometimes you just get lucky. Sometimes you have a story that you want to tell. As Garen said, he wanted to, to look at history um, and take pictures of the history. But some of it is just taking lots of pictures. So back over to you, Scarlett. Do we have any questions? So this is quite a bit back, but Donovan Dolan had a question about one of the um, photos, and I believe it was the night shot at the station set up. And she wanted to know what was the very bright light source to the front of the station building. And Donna, if I've got that photo wrong, you can correct me. Was that the picture with 610 in it? Yes. So she, she's asking about this right here, this spot on the lawn. Well, it's the way the light reflected off of the surface of the... Um... Oh, wait a minute. Let me take a closer look at that. Yeah, that reflected off of the surface area of something that was on the walkway. It was like a light colored pavement and it just, you've got light back or light blowback. Uh, and uh, let, 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 let me say, you know, when you're doing night photography, uh, that there was about probably f four or five strobes that were used to light that picture. And you're always going to get a little bit of light bounce back. So if that's what, if that's what you're referring to, Donna, the little, uh, the, the uh, area right under the uh, light post, Donna? Yeah. yeah I... That was, that was like a reflection off the lighter color. It might have even been very light colored grass and it was reflecting off of that. Sometimes uh, strobes will do that because uh, they're quite powerful. Okay. And they will often bounce over a light uh, area. We have a question from Hank Anderson. He would like for uh, you to say a few words about bracketing, Anne. Okay. Um, bracketing is when you uh, take your camera and you make your adjustments. So you take the exposure and at the f-stop you're thinking about, and then you underexpose a little bit and you overexpose. And on a digital camera, you can do this automatically and you can take three shots or five shots or seven shots, however broad you want your bracket to be. And this is especially useful when you're not sure about the lighting or when you've got mixed um, lighting that you're trying to capture detail. And so you're thinking that you're thinking you got it right, but maybe a little under exposure would give you more detail that you're looking for. Um, and in um, digital photography, you can preset your camera to do this. And usually you'll get a shot that is, if you've chosen your right brackets, the right amount of under and over exposure, usually you'll get an image that you can work with. Um, and so that's, that, that's bracketing. Along with bracketing, let me talk a little bit about um, rapid, rapid fire photography. On my, my digital cameras, I can take as many images as I, I can set my camera to take a single image or multiple images is bursts. Um, now, this really works, especially when you're taking action shots. And you're, for example, we went back to the um, Alex's picture when he took uh, the picture of Millie uh, Kowalczyk christening her locomotive. If you had a rapid sequence imagery, you'd be sure to have one of those rapid fires um, get the image you want. So, so you don't have to depend upon one, two, now go, but oh, you slightly missed it. Well, there's no retake. So this rapid uh, fire 
in digital cameras, cameras of most, most types of digital cameras, you can do. Again, know your equipment and know how to have it set up so that you're not fidgeting with it and miss the whole opportunity. Yeah, well, that picture I took of Millie, uh, when there's like a, about 100 other photographers there, so you had to cut the muscle your way in, and like you say, and I put on 500th of a second, because like, she was moving pretty fast, and I wanted to get the shot, you know, I just wanted to get the shot. I, like I said, I took a double dozen shots, and this when she started to swing the uh, bottle, and I, I got that, and then the, the actual contact with the, with the juice coming out, and a few others shots after that, but uh, that's what you have to do. You, you know, you have to take lots of shots. So when you get home and go to your studio, you can uh, put them up on the screen and see which ones did well, which ones didn't. Okay, I think that is it for the uh, for the questions tonight. I want to just take a special minute to do a special thank you to the folks who put this together, to Ann for the idea and for actually doing the coordination to identify the material and to our panelists, Bob and Alex, for not only your photos, but your participation. And Darren. Yes. <laughs> and to Garen, who we don't often see on camera. Um, so thank you for multiple roles tonight. This has been a great uh, program. I've enjoyed it. I got to see a sneak preview earlier. Now, if you enjoyed these program, these photos, don't log off yet because mm -hmm. we couldn't include everything, but we do have a selection at the end that we're going to cycle through if you'd like to stay on and see those. But before we get there, if you enjoyed the program tonight, you can see it again on YouTube soon. And if you missed any of our previous programs, they're also available on the DCNRHS YouTube channel. So I'll sign off here and we'll end with some more great railroad photos. Good night, everybody, and thanks for coming.